Good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to this second in the series of half a dozen BEMA webinars on net zero and various imperatives towards net zero 2050. Uh, we're very, very happy to have your um, your attention and your, your um, participation in this series. So thank you very much for taking the time on, I know, a very, very busy week for a lot of people. There are a lot of other events. So really, really pleased to have you with us. Um, today, we are talking about thermal storage as a vital component for zero carbon homes. A little bit first about BEMA, just some uh, some housekeeping. So BEMA is the UK Trade Association for Manufacturers and Providers of Energy Infrastructure Technologies and Systems. The uh, website's there on your screen. And if you find the website on that front page, is amongst other things, um, you will find a link to all the uh, white papers that we have published in conjunction with this Net Zero uh, series, including the one we are launching today, which is on thermal storage as a vital component of zero carbon homes. My name is Jeremy Yap. I'm the head of flexible energy systems at BEMA. And with me today uh, to, to speak about the importance of thermal storage, uh, very, very excited and pleased to welcome Randolph Brazier who, from the ENA, Sean Herworth from Blendimplex, Lucas Bergman from Sunam, and Michael Hollins from Warmup. Uh, just before we start, the thermal storage white paper that we will be launching and that is now available on our website, um, I just wanted to run through very quickly some of the headline recommendations in that paper to set the flavour of what we'll be talking about today. So we will be looking to government to identify and target the properties that are most suitable for retrofit heat pumps. And that is largely to accommodate the fact that heat pumps uh, require such th thermal storage capacity. We're also talking about other thermal storage uh, solutions and thermal storage, storage technologies. So um, as you can see, the recommendations follow that train of thought and also look for, to the government to provide more support for consumers, especially with regard to preparing a home, to making it worthwhile to have thermal storage in that home, to future-proof them, to support industry for its training and reskilling, to partner with industry, to help educate consumers about the value of thermal storage, and to ensure that these policies complement other emerging markets to align and coordinate the uh, electrification and decarbonisation of heat alongside the electrification and decarbonisation of things, for example, such as road transport. Industry, meanwhile, needs to work harder and be better at allocating space for thermal storage, especially hot water cylinders, in, in the homes. And we need to anticipate some of the incoming regulations. And we need to promote solutions, clearly, that, um, that, that fit with those. To talk more about the importance of thermal storage, because that's where we begin, I'd like to welcome now Randolph. We are each going to speak for about five or 10 minutes, and then there will be uh, some time for discussion at the end. Please be aware that the chat is visible to all. So um, I believe you should uh, probably, if you have a burning question, you should type it in there, and uh, I'll try to keep track of them and uh, put them to the panel at the end. So Randolph, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Jeremy. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yep. Uh, great. So I'm, as Jeremy said, I'm Randolph. I'm director at the ENA. And if we just go on to the first slide, I'll explain who ENA are. Great. Thanks. So uh, ENA, uh, we uh, stand for the Energy Networks Association. And we represent all of the gas and electricity networks in the UK and Ireland at both a transmission and a distribution level. So at the at the top there, uh, the, the top two maps are our uh, distribution, electricity distribution networks in the top left and the top right, um, the same on the transmission side. We also have National Grid ESO, the system operator in, in GB as one of our members. And then down the bottom, you've got the equivalents um, from the gas network side of things. Next slide, please, Jeremy. 
Thanks. So um, the, the, the slide looks a bit funky. I'm not sure what's happened with the formatting, but but basically the the gist of, of this slide is that from a low carbon technologies perspective and distributed generation perspective, networks fully support the rollout of these technologies and we're very much behind the race to net zero. Um, however, these technologies typically mean intermittency from a renewables perspective. And from a demand perspective, the demands are obviously becoming larger, but also more variable and unpredictable. So what this means is we end up having both a national and a local challenge. The, the national challenge or, or the energy system challenge, that's effectively ensuring that we can balance supply and demand and that we have enough supply to meet the demand when we need it. On a local level perspective, it means effectively having enough capacity in the wires and pipes and, and cables to ensure that whoever wants to connect these technologies can use them when they require. So, so one's a system balancing challenge, one is effectively a capacity challenge, ensuring enough capacity in the networks. Uh, and at ENA and with our members, we're very much working together to address these challenges. Uh, next slide, please, Jeremy. Oops. Sorry. Um. That working? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Perfect. Apologies. Yeah. No worries. Um, so to address, address these two challenges, we, we very much need flexibility. And this is a, a term that's often used um, and, and can mean many different things to many different people. But at a, at a very broad level, it's very much about changing or, or moving when and where electricity is consumed and generated. And there's a range of examples there in the diagram. Uh, and with respect to, to today's seminar, uh, storage is going to be a key source of flexibility. And there's a range of different types of storage available and a range of different sizes. But effectively, you can think of it as having grid scale or seasonal storage. So this is, this is big units that provide a lot of storage, high capacity and high volume of storage. And that is going to play quite a key role. Uh, both in terms of capacity, but also volume for over dark windless periods in winter. Uh, but from a distributor perspective, we're also going to see a lot of storage coming into buildings and residential properties, which is going to be absolutely key to addressing those challenges again. And that storage can be thought of as either electrical storage. So these are things like uh, batteries, like Tesla Powerwall uh, and electric vehicles, which effectively from a network's perspective, we just see as a battery on wheels uh, or thermal storage. So this is things like uh, an, an inertia in the building, thermal inertia, uh, which, which can be effectively seen as a form of storage from a network's perspective, hot water tanks, et cetera. Uh, this is gonna be absolutely key to addressing these issues. Uh, and if we move on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about thermal storage. So. From a national perspective, thermal storage, uh, if you were to make it respond en masse uh, at an aggregated level, it could play a very big role in helping to balance the system when there's a mismatch between supply and demand. Uh, and although an individual unit by itself will have little effect, if you, if you can coordinate it, send the right signals, whether they be price signals and or control signals, and aggregate these units up, we, we've sort of proven with a range of innovation trials that they could have a big effect on this. But it, these devices are also very much going to play a critical role locally in responding to congestion in the local electricity grid. Uh, and to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge, we design distribution networks, or I, I should say have historically designed distribution networks assuming that each household is using on average um, 
somewhere between one and two kilowatts. Uh, however, we're going to be uh, adding these big new devices to homes, uh, whether they be solar panels from a generation perspective or from a demand perspective, could be an electric vehicle charge point, which we're typically seeing as around seven kilowatts, and also a heat pump, which, which can greatly vary in size uh, depending on your type of house and how big it is, etc. Uh, but effectively, those old design standards um, were not were not created, assuming these new technologies connecting to homes. So flexibility at the local level to help release capacity uh, or relieve congestion is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, and this is something that the distribution networks or DNOs are actually using now. So they are. Um, running what we call local flexibility markets, where they're basically saying, you know, in this postcode, we need one gigawatt of turn up generation or turn down demand between 6 and 9 p.m. in winter uh, because they're, they're, we're forecasting congestion then. Uh, and that these markets are very much business as usual now in GB, and the size of the markets is, is growing fairly rapidly. So this year we're tendering uh, around about three gigawatts if you were to add up all those postcodes across gb and we've contracted over half of that already at, at the end of august we've contracted over half of that and it, there's some of these tenders that that are being run open at the moment and this is something that thermal storage can participate in either as an individual unit which is rare but we have seen uh, or aggregated across a number of businesses and, and buildings. Uh, this is something that we're coordinating under our Open Networks project. Uh, and, and this obviously helps networks solve those two challenges I talked about, the lo local and national level, but also, as, as it says in the Beamer paper, creates many benefits for homeowners, uh, especially when you combine it with smart controls or you do aggregate the units. It can obviously reduce costs it can reduce your upfront connection costs because it reduces how big a connection with the grid you need. And it also enables you to, to access various new revenue streams, for example, those local flexibility markets. So that's sort of all I wanted to say for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to drop off now and I will come back for the panel. So thank you very much to Jeremy and Beamer for inviting me and, and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Randolph, much appreciated. And uh, we look forward to picking this up with you uh, after the other presentations. We'll have a, a little bit of time for discussion. So welcome now, uh, Sean Herworth, Head of Channel Marketing at uh, Glenn Vinfix. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, and to Randolph for that introduction. So my name is Sean Herworth, Head of Channel Marketing for Glenn Dimplex. I've been with the business around 11 years now in various roles associated with thermal energy storage. Uh, we're long-term Beamer members and uh, yeah, as part of sponsoring the launch of this white paper, I get a couple of minutes to talk to you about our technologies, uh, what we're seeing as capabilities of contribution for thermal energy storage in the future. On the next slide, please, Jeremy. Oh, went too far. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah, some on the call might be aware, but the UK was the first nation to establish a civil nuclear energy program in contribution uh, to, to its network in 1956. And the roots of our business are back in the late 50s as thermal storage started to be used as a response to the requirements of that changed network. Uh, the numbers are quite difficult to track, but we estimate around 7 million hot water cylinders still installed in the UK, uh, which represents about 50 gigawatt hours of storage potential year round, uh, and also around 5 million electric storage heaters. So in winter, when energy consumption is potentially at its greatest, up to 75 gigawatt hours of storage potential. And alongside that, um, lots of other developments in thermal storage technologies, smart meters, EVs, batteries, local generation, uh, which all contribute to a kind of uh, prosumer and new flexible market, uh, which Randolph was speaking to previously. So you can just bounce to the next slide, please. So in terms of our technologies, uh, through the center, we have a traditional typical off-peak heating uh, for space and also water storage. Heat pump integrated uh, storage, for domestic hot water and a variety of direct acting heating products which work alongside thermal energy storage in a kind of more short term 
flexible um, services capacity. These are presented to the end user and the customer through an app which allows them to control their energy use, their comfort, temperatures, zones, uh, all of the things you'd expect. But perhaps more importantly, they're combined through the Dimplex Control Hub uh, into a cloud of data where we can increasingly use APIs to work with other partners uh, and start to solve some of the issues uh, that electrification has and is going to bring. So if you could jump to the next slide, please, Jeremy. So for around 10 years now, we've been in development in these areas, starting with our quantum high heat retention storage heater and also water heater in 2012. Um, very quickly, we got into five years worth of projects really on demand side management across the world, uh, North America, Australia, Ireland, UK, and then soon got led to the EU Horizon 2020 project for real value, which we as a business led um, 800 properties across three countries, looking not just at the technology application, but also the impact on installers and end users of this kind of technology, their understanding, the way they wanted to interact with it and how the tech uh, and living with it could be best combined. The learnings from those years brought us to the commercial launch of our Dimplex Control uh, IoT platform. And since then, we've been working with commercial partners to look at smart home heating propositions and packages for uh, the uh, kind of end consumer bundling energy contracts, uh, demand side management capabilities and products into various different service offerings um, in different countries. Uh, I would say we're really at the end um, of uh, the unspecified trial period uh, and ready for a degree of commercialization now. So if I can jump just to the next slide, um, I think it would be fair to say that it's been uncovered that there are benefits to just about every stakeholder uh, in the, the lineage of this process. Um, from generators right through to consumers, there's some kind of benefit that thermal energy storage can bring and across the board, the capability to reduce carbon and take us closer to our greenhouse gas emissions and, and net zero future. And then Jeremy, if we could just have the last slide. Um, but it doesn't begin, in my opinion, with the technology. It starts with identifying the need. And if we're going to hit this, these net zero targets, we need to understand what problems those various stakeholders in the market face today and which problems they're likely to face in the future. Uh, look at the value of solving those problems and what the next, next best option is, and then start to enable a market uh, through legislation, through costs uh, and finance. Uh, and also critically, it's, it's often overlooked, but through education uh, of the supply chain and users, so that when we start to see innovation through technologies, partnerships and new business models, uh, we can close the loop and start to solve some of the issues uh, identified in, in Randolph's slides earlier um, and start to bring together technology which is better for people um, and allows for electrification in all its forms, increasing the rollout of heat pumps, more capability to uh, improve transport and electrify transport with EVs. So lots and lots to contribute from this area um, and looking forward to seeing the impact of the white paper and uh, the discussions and further presentations uh, around what thermal storage can bring uh, to, to that uh, proposition. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. And uh, no, no top and tailing from me. There's uh, lots and lots of really interesting points there, but I think we'll leave that to the discussion later. So passing straight to uh, Lucas uh, Bergman, who is uh, from Sunnet. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, um, yeah. So Sunamp is a company um, that has been built on the premise that um, energy storage, and in particular thermal energy storage, is going to be a key vector uh, in any type of decarbonization of our uh, heating and energy system. And um, we are a company that is uh, going to or is revolutionizing thermal energy storage. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, we are active in residential, commercial and industrial uh, applications as well as uh, automotive and work for OEMs. And we apply our technology, which is uh, based on phase change materials to uh, heating, cooling and domestic hot water applications. Uh, next, please. Um, maybe a very brief introduction on PCM and what they are. Um, everybody knows them. Um, everybody knows that ice um, turns from solid to liquid uh, when it goes above zero degrees. 
uh, into water, uh, and that you can re reverse this process. Um, everybody knows that uh, materials like butter or chocolate uh, melt when they uh, go above a certain temperature and that they will re-solidify when they go below that temperature. And that process of melting and solidifying actually um, stores an enormous amount of energy, significantly more energy than you can store just by raising the temperature of a liquid to a slightly higher uh, level. And um, obviously, the examples that I mentioned uh, of ice or, or other organic materials um, uh, do not provide a temperature level that is very useful for applications around the house today or for many applications. Um, but there are other materials and uh, the material that we use um, primarily uh, in our products today um, goes through the solidification and melting process at 58 degrees. It's a similar material, uh, as you can see in the video and also here, as in these uh, small hand warmers, which a lot of you may have already had in their hands. And um, fundamentally, uh, SunAmp has uh, had a breakthrough in stabilizing these materials so that the material lifespan today is uh, more than 50 years uh, based on two cycles a day. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of what that means for the market, I've uh, focused entirely on, on real world applications. Um, and as you can see from these pictures, um, first of all, it means that we can see, provide significant uh, space savings uh, to the market due to the compactness of the uh, energy storage. Um, because we store much more energy in the same volume, um, we free up valuable space in apartments, uh, in, in, in houses, in, in airing cupboards um, to put in shelving uh, or, or yeah, uh, essentially freeing up space for, for storage. Um, but the second advantage that comes from that is that uh, we also provide significant savings of energy due to reduced losses. Um, our product is up to four times uh, better in terms of heat losses compared to existing uh, 10 to 15 year old cylinders in the market. And um, it's still uh, two times better than the heat losses of uh, leading cylinders in the UK market today. Next slide, please. But what the compactness also brings is a much bigger freedom in terms of where to uh, place um, the storage that you need in your in your home, whether it be for space heating or hot water. Um, on the pic in the picture on the left, you see uh, an example from an installation um, by one of our installers, where the equivalent of a 210 liter cylinder, which is normally about the size of a of a fridge. Um, has been placed under under the kitchen counter in what's uh, slightly less uh, space than a than a narrow dishwasher, uh, if you can picture that. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, we see another very important application. Um, our storage is compatible with heat pumps uh, available in the market today, and essentially it allows the installation of full heat pump systems in significantly smaller spaces. Um, here on the right, uh, we have an example where you have about half the, the, the size um, of a normal uh, installation if it had a cylinder. Next slide, please. Um, this is another example of a heat pump installation uh, in a residential uh, kind of single family home property. Um, slightly more complex than the previous one with more additional components. But again, you see that um, it, is a, it is possible to fit all these components in the space of a, of a single airing cupboard uh, where if you had a cylinder uh, in this property, um, it would be absolutely impossible to fit a, a heat pump system uh, into this space. Next slide, please. And a last very important point is that we enable um, the deployment of thermal storage for uh, space heating and hot water also in uh, projects like these, um, a project of seven tower blocks in Sunderland, where the gas combi boilers that were coming up to the end of their life have been replaced with uh, heat pumps uh, connected to a shared ground loop. Next, please. So in this, 
in this project in particular, we have replaced 364 combi boilers um, with uh, heat pumps and heat batteries um, to provide the hot water in the in 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 the um, apartments. And it was uh, the fact that the heat batteries are so compact uh, that enabled them to be installed in the space where the combi boilers were uh, installed uh, previously. Um, otherwise, um, it would not have been possible to store um, or to fit a cylinder in there. Um, what's interesting uh, as well, though, is that obviously this can go two ways. If you want to provide um, time shifting, uh, for example, with a heat pump, um, today uh, you are reliant on uh, usually the building mass, um, which in the UK often is very uh, tricky because of um, suboptimal insulation in many cases uh, and, and low thermal mass uh, inside the building. Um, and essentially, uh, our heat batteries allow you to introduce dedicated uh, thermal storage into, into properties um, to provide uh, space heating time shifting uh, as well. Um, so it really is an enabler for flexibility in the, in the uh, heating space as well. And that's me, thanks. So thank you very much, Lucas, for that, uh, for that presentation. I'm going to stop uh, sharing now, hopefully, That's, and, and uh, invite uh, Michael Hollands, Head of Smart Devices at Warm Up, uh, to give a presentation as well, uh, with, without slides. Michael, do I have you on screen? Hi, guys. Brilliant. Hi. All, all yours, Michael. Thanks. Oh, thanks, thanks Jeremy. Thanks yeah. for joining Hi, us. Um, so I'm Michael Hollins um, from uh, Warm Up PLC, uh, and I head up um, what we call the Smart Devices Division, um, which is basically um, the team responsible for our um, smart thermostats um, and the kind of um, uh, web services and, and, and digital systems that we develop to um, to support those. Um, Many of you will be familiar with Warm Up. Uh, we're uh, sort of the world's best-selling underfloor heating brand. Um, we've sold millions of systems in in over seventy countries. You know, Europe, North America, that kind of thing. Um, and we've been, um, you know, we started out with with electric heating. Um, that's again the thing that many of you will be familiar with and know us for is sort of electric heating for bathrooms, kitchens, that kind of thing. Um, but over the last few years, we've been uh, transitioning more to what we call primary heating, which is basically um, uh, using underfloor heating as the as the main way of um, of, of staying warm um, within the home. Um, so now, uh, to put into context, uh, around half of the um, half of the sort of requests that we get from um, from customers for for quotes and things like that are um, are actually with. Uh, uh, water systems now, sort of primary heating, um, water underfloor heating. So that's been a pretty successful transition for us. Um, but as a result, uh, we've had to um, sort of really think quite hard about the um, the way our systems are used and how we control them. And our you know our vision is uh, to change the way people heat their homes so they live in the most comfortable, efficient, and sustainable uh, environments. And when you then think about what what does that mean? What does what does sustainability mean? Um, the 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 question of flexibility um, comes up, and, and energy storage. And for us, um, you know, there was various ways to try and achieve that. Um, you know, partnering underfloor heating with a with a battery pack or something like that in in the home. Um, but we looked to our own sort of uh, our, our own expertise um, and. Um, you know, an underfloor heating system will typically go into a screed floor um, and a screed floor is, you know, five to six thousand kilos of, of material um, in, 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 you know, square meter pour. Um, and that five to six thousand kilos of material can be used to store energy um, by, by heating it up. Um, so we investigated that further and, and have sort of developed um, a thermal storage solution using um, sort of off the shelf underfloor heating components. So um, a you know typical um, pipe going in with a manifold thermostats to control it um, and then poured in a standard screed. Um, we can store the same amount of energy just in that sort of standard off the shelf install as a in-home battery pack. 
Um, now, for us, that 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 was a was a massive opportunity to kind of move forward in um, helping really offer a solution um, to the UK's electrification process um, by having a kind of um, achievable uh, option for storage of uh, of energy um, without having to increase expense when it comes to building homes. Uh, you know, battery packs can be expensive. Having to have bespoke solutions can be expensive. Uh, the other advantage, obviously, of storing the energy within the um, the, the the existing screed is that the um uh you, you don't lose any space you don't need a uh, a dedicated cupboard for either a cylinder or anything like that uh, it's all it's all within the existing building fabric um now for us um the the question then came back to um the control systems because obviously you can heat the heat that screed up um uh, but then it will it will give off um it will give off that heat into the room for a period of time that it's that it's warm, uh, and what's important is to understand the 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 profile that the occupants within the home um, would like their heating to follow. So you know the schedule of the thermostat is is, is one way of thinking of it. Um, and what what we have to do is um, overlay what the what the occupants want in terms of um, warmth throughout the day, um, and try and build into that profile um, kind of. Uh, sort of charging up, as it were, of the screed so that we can then store that energy at times when perhaps it's, it's more um, efficient to, um, to, to, to draw energy from the grid or cheaper to draw energy from the grid, depending on, on your own setup. Or maybe even if you've got solar PV, drawing energy um, from those panels when they're able to, to generate um, so you can then provide useful heat um, for the occupants in the evening when they want to be warm, but those solar panels won't be generating energy. Um, so we've been developing systems that um, will allow that um, decision making when when to sort of charge up that that thermal energy store um, and when it will be used by the occupants usefully. We've been building systems to to do that automatically. Um, again, some of you may be familiar with our um, smart thermostats. We've we've um, had smart thermostats in the market now um, for the last six years, um, and those have been providing really useful data for us. Um, and, and and we've recently. Um, launched uh, a new one you see here um, and with these with these devices we are um, we're able to um, not only know the exact temperatures of the of, of all the rooms across our entire network so it's hundreds of thousands of, of connected devices reporting back data um, for our system we're, we're able to look at the the temperatures um, in, internally externally and also of the floor as well as the usage patterns and things like the status of the relay, whether the heating is actually uh, on right now or, or, or not. And um, with that, we can then start building um, predictive models. Um, so on our cloud systems, we are um, developing AI um, algorithms that will predict um, the outcome of different um, heating profiles. So different options for when we choose to charge, the, charge that thermal energy store for the user and then how that would then look with their desired profile uh, and also how that would work with um, potential changes in energy prices throughout the day um, from, from a supplier that maybe offers a kind of um, half hourly settlement um, or maybe off peak pricing. Um, so we can overlay it with that to optimize the, the way we use energy to, to, to deliver the cheapest energy bills um, for those occupants. Uh, but there's other things as well, like I said, um, in terms of looking at other sources of energy within the home, if they're solar PV or batteries, using those as efficiently as possible as well. Um, and those systems are, um, because they're cloud-based, they work with all of our existing smart thermostats in the, in the market, and they also work with all of our future ones as well. Um, and as a result, we think we've got a really good, um, you know, robust, uh, sort of understandable solution to help deliver really large-scale flexibility um, of, of energy within the UK, um, the the if you think about the number of new homes being built, um, and they're being built in ways that uh, easily work with underfloor heating, uh, which itself, regardless of energy flexibility, underfloor heating is around thirty to forty percent more efficient as a way of warming the home um, than just radiators, even with the same heat source, the same boiler or heat pump. Just switching to underfloor heating uh, gets you an efficiency benefit without even the flexibility benefit as well. Um, but we think that um, with just the systems that we are hoping to um, deliver over the next four years, that we'll be able to provide into um, into the UK uh, around 500 um, megawatt hours of storage, which we think is is significant. It's it's a it's a part to play in the process, and we hope others kind of 
help help get there as well, which which we can see from today up they are. Um, but yeah, for, for us, we think um, we're, we're able to provide a useful solution and um, we're excited to kind of help um, help that decarbonisation and electrification process that the UK needs in order to in order to hit net zero. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, really fascinating to hear all the speakers with uh, some really different uh, perspectives, different solutions, if you like. Um, so thanks everyone for overloading me with questions in the chat. That's brilliant. Really, really appreciate that. Um, if you uh, if you do have any questions from the panel, then for the panel, then please feel free to type them in as as we speak. Um, obviously, at, like any good chair, I have a few in my pocket just just ready. Um, let's just pull out a little bit for a more general discussion, and perhaps we can come at specific solutions in, in a minute. There are lots of things that we need to be to realise the potential benefits of thermal storage. I think we need to, as a country maybe, we need to be smart enough so the, the, um, the buildings we live in need to be automated and smart and responsive enough. We need to be well insulated enough. We need consumers to be engaged enough. We need markets. We need uh, lots of policy support and there are lots of things we can talk about um, in that respect. I want to touch on some of them. Could we talk initially about the thermal properties or the thermal capacities of the buildings these are going into? I think most of you are talking about um, mostly domestic buildings. Certainly Randolph, I know that you're looking to achieve some flexibility gains from every kind of building. But just listening to uh, Sean and Lucas and Michael speak, I think there are lots of different applications, industrial and commercial and so on, but really we're talking about homes for the moment. Um, how much are you dependent on a well-insulated, well-built building stock? And how much do you think you can just put your product in now as we upgrade? Is there a sequence to this or what or should we just crack on with thermal storage in our sort of British boosterish way and insulate as we go uh, that's a general I, I'm just going to open that we, we, we've done some work on this um, and we um, for, for, for our um, um, sort of planning and, 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 and development we actually don't use um, current building standards as the um, as, as the comparison um, because we're, you know, we're aware that um, so much of the, the UK's housing stock are not up to those standards. So we typically use a kind of um, a hybrid of, you know, a 70s era home that's maybe gone through some sort of refurbishment. Um, and we use that as our baseline. Um, so for the thermal storage um, solution that I was just talking about using sort of that underfloor heating system, um, charging that up effectively gives around two and a half hours of, of useful um, energy, which basically is enough to shift from, um, from from our sort of testing, is enough to shift um, a peak of energy. You know, between that um, eight till eight till ten in the morning, and then your you know your four till seven in the evening, we're able to shift those those peaks early enough to be within the um, the, the 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 lower. Um, Area. So, so we believe actually a relatively simple system like that with a not particularly well um, insulated home is still capable of delivering the flexibility that the uh, the, the, the grid requires. So there's a, um, a line to be drawn here between responsiveness and thermal um, capacity, but maybe. Um, Sean, yeah. you've... Oh, go on, Lucas. Yes, please. Yeah, um, sorry. Uh, I... We, we, we have a fairly um, firm view on this topic um, purely out of um, looking at what is required to get us to zero carbon in the building stock by 2050, which is really, really close in uh, replacement cycle terms. Um, and fundamentally, uh, we, we have to um, replace heating systems and upgrade them to, to flexible electric heating systems where we can today. 
and we have to uh, insulate where we must. And these things um, do not have to happen in, in sequence. So there's often um, the, the slogan of fabric first uh, being used. If we uh, wait until we have insulated all of our buildings before we deploy um, zero carbon heating solutions, um, we will never ever hit the targets that we need to hit. And um, there's also a side benefit. If we today um, deploy a heating system and an electrified uh, heating system with sufficient storage to uh, efficiently run a, a larger or let's say a home with higher heat losses than, than, than optimal and then insulate this property uh, down the line. Uh, what you will get is you will get a huge extension in the time uh, that you can bridge uh, in terms of energy consumption. So where previously you sized your uh, system, for example, just to avoid the four hour peak uh, in the afternoon. Um, if you then insulate the building, uh, you will then be able to bridge maybe half a day, uh, potentially even more uh, than that um, after after the insulation. So we really have to work on both sides at the same time. Insulate where we absolutely have to and uh, replace and upgrade where you can. I, I complete, if I nod any more vigorously, my head's going to fall off. I really I, I agree with that. Randolph, you look like you're in agreement as well. Can I bring you in here to talk about this? Yeah, um, yes, yeah, so I, I completely agree with Lucas. So. From a from a network's perspective, we don't really care how we get the flexibility. To be honest, <laughs> we're we're technology agnostic. But from what we have seen, speaking to customers, you know, the the fabric first approach is is quite challenging. Not just because of cost, but because of disruption and physical difficulty in doing it in the homes. And and I think, as Lucas said, if you do pair, say, a heat pump with storage it can buy you time and you can do that later down the line. It's still going to give us flexibility in the meantime. So although we are agnostic, um, we are quite firm believers in having that storage. It's also typically faster response time than just using thermal inertia in a house, for example, which can help us with, gives us more options basically in terms of the services that we procure from these devices. So one of the things we talked about a lot during the initial years, the early years of the smart metering program was how many other things we could load onto that site visit. Um, had all sorts of people asking for all sorts of other additional things to go into that site visit because everyone was so excited that every home was and small business in Great Britain was going to be visited by someone. Um, clearly we couldn't do everything. It feels to me, further to uh, Malcolm Watkinson's excellent question in, in the chat, is part of educating installers and householders about this technique, these techniques is to, without using a horrible word like holistic, trying to run them together as, um, as, as packages, as comprehensive solutions that people can begin. It's a, it's a journey. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be, well, you can't touch them in storage until you've got your fabric done or, or vice versa. Sean, you've um, got a lot of experience in this. Yeah, and uh, I guess to kind of echo some of the responses from previous. Um, so to, to your first question, uh, I think thermal storage is scalable. Uh, it could be that the whole heating and hot water load and other loads uh, for relatively poorly insulated properties gets converted. Um, and it could be that in a new build property, then allowances are made for thermal storage. I think the really important thing um, within there is control. As long as that thermal storage has the capability to scale down its output as the fabric of the building improves, you, you've not introduced an issue. Um, and you know there are manufacturers on the call and, and out there as well who will respond to whatever requirement be, be it you know fast frequency response or, or mass hot water storage or all sorts of things. So I don't think any of those problems are things we can't solve. Um, the second part of the answer to that, I believe, moves into the question uh, that Malcolm's asked, which is, you know, if we're going to educate people, we need to start early. So we can't wait to introduce these systems in 10, 15 years time at the next round because we'll be starting from scratch telling people about them. And one of my concerns as well would be, we're going to spend time 
teaching people and consumers to rip out systems that we then replace uh, in, a, in a very like-minded way shortly. So I think education goes hand in hand with consistency of approach and talking early absolutely about heat pumps and absolutely about electric vehicles, but also about some of the other supporting uh, technology functions and segments that can go in there so that the installation uh, stakeholder area has the chance to learn about those systems and recommend them um, and consumers get used to them as well and we haven't removed that capability and then completely replaced it again because we've we've no time to waste between now and 2050 and I think if we were to go backwards we would struggle to hit the target in this area. So I, I was going to ask about how we prioritize but you your point about controllable uh, the, the the important point is control is too compelling to to miss out on. So I want to come to that first. Um, are we smart enough? And if not, how do we get smart enough? Because it's more than just a smart meter here. Um, Randolph, do you have a, oh, sorry, if you want to take that, Sean, uh, take that first, but I, I want to bring you all in on, on this yes. question of smart control. Okay. So very briefly, yeah, from a, from a technology perspective, I believe we are. We have you know capabilities across all sorts of different areas. Um, defining the problem and applying that to the homes um, is the right thing. And I actually believe that typically you'll find uh, the technology that suits a property also will, will offer what's required in that space. You know, so there's there's a mix of properties out there. Uh, your solution for new buildings is not going to be the same as your solution for large, poorly insulated old buildings. But within that spread, is going to give the, the flexibility ultimately that everybody's looking for. So um, I think that control capability, if you apply the right solution and your uh, legislative framework allows you the breadth of technology to apply the right solution to those different different areas, um, I think it's, it's something that can be solved here. Yeah. How the DNO is feeling about that, Randall? Yeah, I agree with Sean. The text there, this isn't a technology problem. The, the text there, whether it's either just within the home or also when you're talking about aggregation, this the, the challenges of rolling this out are very much a cost and to a slightly lesser extent, a disruption problem. It's mm -hmm. the cost of getting the, the cost and education required with getting these devices in the home. It, there's no challenge really with the tech itself. It's already there, it's been proven, it works. It's about overcoming things like capital cost, educating people about you know a whole systems or whole lifetime cost of an asset and how it's cheaper to run it than, you know, but people obviously only think about the, the upfront cost. Uh, and then there, there is a disruption piece as well, um, which, mm. which is a bit of a barrier. Um, but I, I don't, I, I sort of tend to agree with Sean, the tech's there, this isn't a tech problem. So, without wanting to be pedantic, I feel like the tech is there in the sense that it exists. I don't think it's rolled out. And, Correct, um, because of the cost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. that that feels like a, a massive in, in, imperative. Um, yeah. So perhaps for my question for you all, how do we prioritise? Do, do we want to, do we want the government to identify the, be the best, most suitable homes and try to get all the housing types, dwelling types, and try to get thermal storage and smart tech and insulation and all the rest of it there? Or do we prioritize by saying, well, if there's a consumer living in it and they want it, we'll give it to them. What's the what's the driver? How, how centralized? Yeah, Randall. So you could probably let the market solve this if you had 100 years. Um, you know, the market would eventually solve this. Costs have slowly come down, but, you know, the chances are that, you know, it's going to take too long. And also we don't have the time of net zero, right? Yeah. So when you've got a change program like this, there's very few historical examples, if any, of there being no government intervention. So there's going to have to be some sort of government intervention. Now, some of that needs to be on the capital cost, probably. That can either be direct subsidies or it can be things like incentivizing new business models. Like I know some of the suppliers are looking at where you effectively remove the, the upfront cost from customers and they pay it back on based on their savings. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also then look at how you can um, price the ongoing use of whatever the energy is, in this case, electricity, and ensuring that that accurately reflects costs and also externalities. So, you know, a big part of this is going to be properly pricing carbon, 
ensuring that you know the, the cost of electricity is properly priced, all the externalities are factored into that versus gas, et cetera. But there will have to be some sort of government intervention, uh, both on the capital side and on the operating side of the cost spectrum. And I, I would add to that as well, I think there's a, a requirement for intervention as well in rewarding the specifications of systems uh, in, in um, yeah, energy performance certificates, any, any the breadth of HVAC um, specification tools so that the right thing to do for that building and the recommendation to that consumer that that installer can confidently make is to introduce whatever form of thermal storage might be relevant to that building. Because without that, um, my fear is that you know, the, the, uh, it will never be the right option. It will never be recommended because the system will never recognize it as an improvement despite the networks and, uh, uh, and others seeing and what it could, what it could do. That, That's definitely the, the, the current issue in, in my mind. The, the regulatory framework um, works against um, installing thermal storage yeah. in, in, in homes, in new new builds, and and, and, and anything Absolutely. like that. So, the, you know, the the, the framework is not um, fit for purpose, um, mm. uh, despite the acceptance um, fairly widely that, that storage is needed and to a large extent. Um, even even if you take the cost aspect out of it, you know, the additional cost of a new um, component in the system, which we've done by saying you know we, we can build it into something existing we still struggle on the with the regulatory framework because we're actually disadvantaged within those um within those um rules um to have our system specified because um you know the carbon intensities are, are not up to date um and the um, responsiveness of the system is not adequately um taken into account so that, for me that's the the number one thing that needs to be changed and from that the rest will follow because the market will then become incentivized by those um, regulations to install homes that are that are, crop, are properly specified. Michael, I'm really glad you brought this up, um, partly because it, Andrew, uh, it uh, answers Andrew Stimson's question, which is excellent. I was going to circle back to that. But uh, so an another BEMA member who uh, we had hoped to include in this panel, but uh, unfortunately there it wasn't there wasn't room on on, on the panel. Um, uh, Johan uh, de Plessis from uh, Tepio who makes a zero emission boiler. Uh, we've been having uh, detailed discussions with, with him about the challenges of the regulatory framework for what are actually um, excellent and viable and suitable and cost effective uh, electrification solutions that perversely, I mean, it seems like to me like a massive own goal, but for non-technical reasons, these things are quite are, are challenging to get into homes. So um, there are clearly some uh, non-technical regulatory barriers that need to be addressed and uh, specifically around electrification. Um, I would love to talk more about this, but I really do actually want to answer Malcolm's question, which is not just to acknowledge that we do need to educate installers and householders, but let's pretend we've got 60 seconds to solve that problem. You're a homeowner, you don't really know all that much, you just want a warm house, you want it, you know, you don't want to spend tens of thousands of pounds, but maybe you want underfloor heating, maybe you you want more room, you've got a hot water cylinder, you're not sure what to do, you don't have a heat pump yet, but you want to get one. How do we educate the installers, the home renovators, the builders? How do we get to them? So instead of saying, oh, I'll just stick another boiler in, you'll be right, mate, let me, let me rip out that cylinder and I'll give you a combi. How do we educate them in the importance of thermal storage what where's the messaging coming from and don't say being i could yeah i, I, I could maybe have a go. <laughs> i see it as analogous to um the move to smart thermostats or smart controls over the last 10 years when they first came out people thought it's a gimmick it's do i really need this i've got a thermostat mm -hmm. i don't need something and now um you know for us it's our it's our um volume um we, we offer non smart controls uh, but the majority of people pick smart controls now because of the other advantages that come with it um but we've been able to then build into it the additional efficiency um uh, and, and sort of automatic control and i see the same thing here i think it will come from um bundling thermal storage into things that people find attractive and desirable um and then expanding out from there so that they actually want a uh, they, they take a decision on something they want um, and that could be from the installer side as well, something that they feel comfortable installing or something they feel comfortable working with. 
that has thermal storage bundled with it in some form or other. Yeah. Um, and then that will start getting it into the market. And then from there, the education can take place um, sort of organically. Yeah. I think the I think large educational campaigns have not worked in the past. Um, you know, these kind of TV ads and stuff, they don't work, people don't get it. And instead you need to, um, I think, attach um, the thing that we want to deliver into um, things that people already desire and then roll it out that way and allow it to organically organically spread. Right, final comment uh, from uh, Lucas and then Sean. Um, are you piggybacking on the heat pump rollout? Are you excited about this? Is this, is this as, as what Michael's saying about uh, bundling things together, is, it, is this the way to do this? Um, comment, I mean, we, we're, we're definitely excited uh, and fully supportive of the heat pump rollout. Um, and I think that with that, we will very quickly uh, see the uptake of, of thermal storage as well. Um, from my point of view, the key element to make it happen, though, is um, to also enable access to the value that it generates to the consumers. Um, that can be through different vectors, different business models, but it has to be passed through uh, to the consumer side because otherwise there's no incentive for them yeah. to do it. And at the moment, well, the the incentive is is just not there properly. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Sean, final comment from you and then I'm going to wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's great um, to see the introduction of heat pumps at scale. I would like uh, us as an industry to recognize if we believe it exists the issue that's going to be created by that uh, that uh, has been spoken to today and start to bring the other technologies along um, but i think they'll force the issue if you see widespread rollout and you start to create local and national transmission um, problems then those will be pulled through anyway uh, and just to the previous point um, i mean around 50 percent of the buildings in the uk are will be let in some format rather than home owned so if you approach those energy performance certificates uh, and you can find a way to legislate into homes correctly uh, then you're halfway there um, and then educating is, is only the other half of the market and uh, just to one yeah. comment that i saw up here i don't know if you've seen it um, jeremy it's uh, appeared separately but in terms of anticipation um, of the heat and building strategy and what we see coming out of that uh, I, it would be great to see more wide-scale recognition of thermal storage i think if we just see the shoots of um, the, or the beginnings of an acceptance that it's not a single technology which is going to solve the electrification problem. That will be enough to give hope to the industry and probably start to make its way towards formalising uh, what other contributions such as this look like. Excellent, thank you. And uh, great to see thermal storage explicitly recognised in the Scottish um, heat strategy. So we uh, hope to see something similar from government when we finally see that strategy. Really, really uh, grateful. I feel like I want to schedule another half hour or an hour now to talk about how we are offset upfront capital costs and reward the value of flex providers and uh, how we create that market and all sorts of other issues. But we have to stop it there. But thank you very much to uh, to all the speakers. The, um, the Beamer Smart Building Group uh, is working very hard to, um, obviously, we've just published this paper. We're working very hard on the design of a smart home architecture and to uh, to provide a smart home that gives Randolph's members the flexibility and the grid stability they need, that provides the interoperability that consumers want, that protects uh, consumer energy data and their privacy and the cybersecurity of the system and all that. There's a lot to do. We will be publishing another larger paper on um, thermal storage uh, in, the, in the coming months. I think this white paper, which I commend to you, uh, is really just the, the beginning of a conversation. The regulatory barriers are immense and we really need to, uh, to do something about that, but there's a lot yet to achieve. Can I thank uh, the panel again? Thanks Elemental for providing the platform. Thanks to all of those who, uh, who asked questions and, and made comments and uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and uh, stay safe. Any questions, I think you know how to reach me. I'm very happy to uh, to in engage in this conversation more. So thanks, thanks again, everyone. Great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.